Thank you for choosing to worship with us. We've been so encouraged in these weeks to holding on to the community that we have and to seeing everybody showing up in the in the stream on Facebook and watching on YouTube and commenting on YouTube, subscribing there. And all of those things are so great to see us holding together because we miss being together in our building. But we know that what makes the church great isn't the fact that they have a building or the fact that they gather together in large numbers. It's what happens after they gather together and after they study and after they worship. It's the way that they go out into the world and represent the kingdom of God. And so we're holding on to our gathering as best we can. And we love seeing people saying hello and saying where they're worshiping from in the comments. And in fact, if you would right now, would you comment where you're worshiping from and who you're with? Because we're so amazed by the different places that people are jumping into church. But we're going to hold on to the important things in this time. Community being one of them, worship being another of them. And so whether you're in your living room or your bedroom or your backyard or Scotland or Florida or wherever you are and you're worshiping with us today, sing out and join us in worship in these next few minutes. And then later, Mike is going to share a message asking a tough question about God and a tough question about God in the midst of a difficult season but we're gonna have church together today we're gonna hold on to our community today and we're thankful that technology allows us the opportunity to do that but we can't wait to be back together we're looking forward to the times when we're back together but in the meantime we won't let anything stop us from praising god because we know that he's the one that's going to see us through so in these next few minutes join us in worship in the way that you can wherever you are Thank mm -hmm. you. He is not confined, he confounds. He will not resign, he resounds. He is not restrained. Oh, hear the sound, oh, hear the sound. The rocks are falling, the broken calling to the God who moves the mountains. The earth is shaking, the weary waking to the God who moves the mountains. The God who moves the mountains, yeah. He is not surprised, he surrounds. He cannot be stopped, he astounds. He is drawing near, oh hear the sound. Oh, hear the sound. Rocks are falling, the broken calling to the God who moves the mountains. The God who moves the mountains. The earth is shaking, the weary waking to the God who moves the mountains. The God who moves. The mountains, yeah. You move the mountains. You say speak, and we say move. You say watch, what you can do. You say trust. And then you prove You're the God who moves the mountains The God who moves the mountains You say speak And we say move You say watch What you can do You say trust And then you prove You're the God who moves the mountains, the God who moves the mountains. 
mountains Rocks are falling The broken calling To the God who moves the mountains The earth is shaking The weary waking To the God who moves the mountains The God who moves the mountains are falling, the broken calling to the God who moves the mountains, the God who moves the mountains. The earth is shaking, the weary waking to the God who moves the mountains, the God who moves the mountains. So, Lord, we come before you this morning, recognizing that you are the God who works wonders and even moves mountains in front of us. And so, God, as we continue in our worship, may you make that new in our lives this morning. May you remind us of your greatness as we sing. Be close, close to your side, so heaven is real and death is a lie. I want to hear voices of angels above, singing as one, hallelujah, holy, holy, God almighty. The great I am, who is worthy, none beside thee, God Almighty, the great I am. I want to be near, near to your heart, loving the world hating the dark I want to see dry bones living again singing as one hallelujah holy holy God almighty the great I am who is worthy none beside God Almighty, the great I am. He's the great I am, the great I am. and shake before you the demons run and flee at the mention of the name king of majesty there is no power in hell or any who could stand before the power and the presence of the great i am the great i am the great i am Great I am, who is worthy. 
majesty there is no power in hell or any who can stand before the power and the presence of the great I am great I am the great I am the great I am the great I am the great I am hallelujah holy holy God almighty the great I am who is worthy none beside thee God almighty the great first phrase of that song where it says I want to be close to your side so that heaven is real and death is a lie I want to hear voices of angels above singing as one hallelujah and you know even though we're all separated right now and in our own homes isn't it great to know that when we gather together in worship all of heaven rejoices as one with us and singing hallelujah to our king and I love that we get to do that and even though it's been different these last several weeks, I, I want to direct us to a time of communion right now. And so as you gather your things together, gather your juice and your bread or your crackers or whatever you're using for communion, I just want to remind us of why we do that. You know, we take the bread and the cup every week and we say, God, this reminds me of your blood spilled for me. The bread broken reminds me of your body broken on the cross for me, for my sins. And you know, it doesn't matter if we're doing this in our homes together or if we're gathered in the big group setting together. We take communion to remind ourselves of what Jesus has done for us, of the amazing, wonderful price he paid for us on the cross so that we can know him. And so as we continue with this time, I just ask you to go before God, ask him to recenter your heart, to get your mind in tune with him so that we can hear clearly what he has to say. Let's pray. Dear Lord, as we come together this morning, we thank you and recognize you as the Lord of our lives. Lord, we thank you for the sacrifice of your Son so that we could know you, so that we can have salvation, and so that we can know the joy and peace that you provide. Lord, I pray that you bless all that happens this morning. In your Son's name we pray. Amen.
are in uncharted territory. Where we are now, we have never been before in our lifetime, and it's making us ask some questions. Hey, my name is Mike. If this is your first time worshiping with us, thank you for being with us today. I'm the lead pastor at MCC, and over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be answering some questions that have bubbled to the surface during this time. Next week, Adam is going to be talking about uh, why is peace so hard to find in stressful situations. The week after that, I'll be talking about why isolation has been so hard. But for today, in the midst of a worldwide pandemic that threatens not only our physical health, but our emotional health, our relational health, our financial health, my guess is that you or someone you know has asked this question, God, why do bad things happen? And listen, it's not like we didn't know that life in general, normal, everyday life can be hard. It's not always, but it has its moments. But every once in a while, something bad happens. And, and maybe it only affects you, or, or maybe it only affects your family, or maybe it only affects our nation, or maybe, like now, it affects the whole world. And I hadn't thought about this, but I heard someone say this week, what's troubling is there's no safe place, there's nowhere that's safe that you can go in the world to get away from this. But when something like this happens, it makes people wonder. And maybe, maybe it makes you wonder. If God really is all-powerful, if he really is all-knowing, if God really is all-loving, why do bad things happen? It's been years ago now, but the Barna Research Company did a survey. It was taken nationally between both followers of Jesus and those who don't, and they asked uh, this question. They said, if you could ask God only one question and you knew he would give you the answer, what would you ask? Overwhelmingly, the number one response to that question was, why is there pain and suffering in the world? Why, God, do bad things happen? And right now, we're focused on this virus, but we know it's not just that. A neighbor loses everything in, in a house fire. A drunk driver crashes into an innocent family. Jobs are being eliminated. Some states suffer under a flood while others suffer under a drought. A fundraiser is being held to help someone deal with medical bills while they're fighting cancer, divorce papers are finalized. And as you glance from story to story, maybe you've whispered to yourself, if there is a God in heaven, why is there so much heartache? Eugene Peterson, who wrote the message, paraphrase of the Bible, wrote, it's not the suffering that troubles us. It's the undeserved suffering. Listen, there are three teachings in Scripture that don't seem to fit together. And the first one is this, God is good. In other words, uh, he's absolutely pure, he hates evil, and he has to deal with everything that is in rebellion to him. The second teaching is that God is great, which means, by the way, that God is all-powerful and that he can conquer anything that challenges him. The third teaching is that evil is real, which means that, in fact, there are things that are in rebellion to God and are at this very moment challenging him. Now, this is a problem because as God, he would certainly know about evil. And if he's really good, he would condemn evil and actually want to do something about the evil. And if he's truly great, that is, if he really is all-powerful, then he would follow through and actually do what his goodness demands, which is destroy all evil. Which brings us back to how could a good God allow bad things to happen, which is a fair question also an important question. This is generally considered to be the number one issue causing people to doubt or disbelieve the existence of God. Do you know why that is? 18 years ago, Max Lucado, Christian author, was in New York City, and it wasn't long after 911. He was riding in a taxi, and he asked the driver how 911 had affected him, and the driver said, well, I'm, I, I constantly get lost now. And Lucado asked him to explain what he meant by that. And he said, those towers let me know where I was anywhere in the city. But now that those towers are gone, I've lost my bearings. That's, that's what happens. We, we lose our bearings. So how do we answer this question? This morning I want to walk through basically three answers, three responses to that. And the first one is... When I wonder, God, why do bad things happen, my, the first response is, I, I can blame God. 
Corey Ten Boom, who suffered persecution at the hands of the Nazis, admitted that she once cried out in frustration, God, if this is how you treat your friends, no wonder you don't have very many. Another Holocaust survivor more bluntly said, if this is the best God can do, then maybe he should resign from his job and put someone else in his place. The Old Testament reminds us of this. Lamentations, Old Testament book of Lamentations, for he, that is God, does not enjoy hurting people or causing them sorrow. So what's going on? If God doesn't enjoy doing that, why is it happening? Why do bad things happen? You know, sometimes God is accused of causing events he didn't cause. So when bad things happen, sometime, sometimes the why is Satan. Satan's primary goal is to turn people away from God, which is why Peter uh, describes him this way when he writes at the end of the New Testament, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. We need to remember that our enemy is real and that he is out to bring us down. Now, his power is limited, but we should not underestimate his ability to bring bad things to bear in our lives. And when that happens, we need to remember that Satan is the source of evil, not God. As a matter of fact, when Paul writes to the church in Ephesus, he reminds them that our struggle is not against flesh and blood but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Listen, did you know that the devil is mentioned by every author in the New Testament? And particularly by Jesus, who taught us to pray, right, deliver us from the evil one. I read this past week that men focus on the webs of evil. Jesus named the spider. Listen, when bad things happen, sometimes the why is someone else's, sometimes sinful, choices. I want to make sure you get that. We'll talk about that. But when Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, the world changed forever. Their sin introduced physical illnesses and disease to mankind. Prior to destroying the world uh, through the flood, we're told in Genesis chapter 6 that God saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. The sin of people resulted in God's destruction of the earth, and the sins of people today often result in horrible events happening. A commonly estimated figure is that as much as 90% of the suffering of the world comes through human causes. Murder, war, human trafficking, torture, racial discrimination, domestic abuse, sexual abuse. That list goes on and on. And God didn't want any of this. And he warns us against all of it in many scriptures, including the Ten Commandments, which he gave us to keep us from sin and actually to protect us from each other. But we live in a world where people do what they want to do, and therefore all kinds of sin and abuse and damage can occur. We should never underestimate the impact of other people's sinful choices in our lives when bad things happen. But honestly, sometimes it's not even a sinful choice. Sometimes someone makes a choice, simply makes a choice, and it has a negative impact on us. You know, some believe that the COVID virus jumped from animals to humans in the Wuhan live market, uh, from an interaction between an animal and a human. Now that's far from conclusive, but if it's something like that, that's not a sinful choice. From my vantage, it's a gross choice. But it's just a choice, and it has had worldwide unintended uh, uh, causes. Listen here. Sometimes we need to recognize that bad things happen because of my choices. God has given us the freedom of choice, and that is a wonderful freedom that we need to thank God for our free will. But along with freedom, we have to take responsibility for our decision to overeat or to not exercise or to drink alcohol to excess or to smoke or to not wear our seatbelt or not get a medical checkup or to hammer nails without safety glasses or to drive on ice covered roads or live promiscuously or worry or be a workaholic or hundreds of other daily choices that we make. Cause and effect are facts of life. And if we make choices that are bad, we stand a chance of not only facing the consequences of those decisions, but our de decisions can affect others around us as well. So, first response. When I wonder why God allows bad things, I can blame God. 
Here's the second response, though. When I wonder, God, why do bad things happen? It can cause me to question God. Do you ever find yourself doing that? I see sometimes I question God's existence. If God is there, why doesn't he do something? Sometimes I find myself questioning uh, God's goodness and compassion. God knows about evil and has the power to vanquish it, but apparently doesn't care enough to deal with it. When I do that, I'm questioning God's compassion and his goodness, and yet we read in Psalm 103 and in several other places throughout Scripture that the Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger. He abounds in love. You know, sometimes what I'm questioning is God's ability and power. When your friend has asked or you have thought, maybe God wants to help, but he just doesn't have the ability Harold Kreshner wrote a book called Why Bad Things Happen to Good People in response to watching his son die as a teenager from a rare disease, and he concluded that God cared but couldn't do anything about it. You know, what's important for us to remember is that we're talking about the creator of the universe who spoke the world into existence. And so saying that he cares but is unable to do anything about it seems a bit odd. In Job chapter 42, Uh, We read, I know, Lord, that you are all-powerful, that you can do everything that you want. And listen, I just want to say that those are all normal responses for people to have to blame God, to question God, especially in crisis. And, And many times, even those of us who follow him fall into one of those two responses, at least initially. But I hope that we can eventually get to this one. That when I wonder, God, why do bad things happen? My response could be to trust God. In his book, A Dangerous Wonder, Mike Iaconelli tells about a woman who was vacationing on one of the barrier islands in South Carolina. And one night along the beach, she saw a loggerhead turtle. Now, that's one of those huge turtles, 300 pounds, laying its eggs in the sand. And she said she hurried back the next morning to see the eggs more closely. However, she was alarmed to discover that the turtle's tracks were heading in the wrong direction. Instead of heading into the water, it actually headed into the sand and the dunes. And so she followed the tracks and soon located the turtle covered with hot, dry sand. She notified a park ranger about the turtle's precarious situation and the ranger told her that it wouldn't be a problem. They deal with that all of the time. So he rolled the turtle over on its back wrapped tire chains around its legs and hooked the chains to his jeep and then he drove off he drug the turtle across the dunes at the edge of the ocean he unhooked the turtle flipped her upside right and drove away leaving this uh, lady to watch a somewhat dazed turtle but she said as the water began to lap against the turtle's body she roused herself and waded out a little deeper and then swam away. And the lady would later write, sometimes it's hard to tell whether you're being killed or being saved by the hands that turn your life upside down. When Kyle Eidelman uh, wrote about suffering, he drew this parallel between taking our kids to get shots. Uh, I don't know if you remember when you took your children, if you have children, when they were infants and you took them to get their shots, I still remember the first vaccinations that Casey and Josh received. They were babies sitting on my lap, fat, dumb, and happy because they had no idea what was about to happen. And the nurse was smiling at them as she pinched their chubby little legs and stuck a needle into their thighs. And they watched it go in, and then they looked at her with this look of terror. And then they looked at me as if to ask, why are you allowing her to inflict this pain with that needle? And listen, our kids know we're not the ones inflicting the pain but they also know we're allowing it to happen. When that next round of shots comes, do you think they don't remember? I've been to this place and I don't think I, I don't have good feelings here. Is it possible that we can get to a place where we say there is a God, one who is good, one who is great, and who nevertheless allows hurting in our world for a season and can turn that suffering into something for his greater purposes? I think it's also wise for us to admit to ourselves that we don't have a simplistic solution that wraps this problem up in a nice, neat little bow that makes everyone feel good about this. In fact, there's nothing 
that we can say that will make people suddenly okay with the evil around them or the suffering in their lives because honestly we're not okay with it but Tim Keller in his book the reason for God writes this just because you can't see or imagine a good reason why God might allow something to happen doesn't mean that there isn't one again we see lurking within supposedly hard-nosed skepticism an enormous faith in one's own cognitive faculties if our minds can't plumb the depths of the universe for good answers to suffering, well, then there just can't be any. He writes, this is blind faith of a high order. Sometimes we want a God who is so big he can do anything and so small that we can understand everything. And he writes, the problem is we can't have it both ways. I like the way Warren Wiersbe says it. We don't live our Christian life on explanations. We live them on promises. So in John 16, Jesus is talking to his followers about what's about to happen. He's going to be crucified and how it will impact their lives. And then he tells them this. I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In the world, in this world, you will have trouble. But take heart because I have overcome the world. And I just want you to note that Jesus never sugarcoated reality you will have trouble sometimes because we have an enemy uh, when I was in youth ministry I would tell our students God does not hate you and Satan does not love you sometimes it's because of our own sin sometimes it's my choices sometimes it's someone else's choices regardless the reality is that God allows it to happen you will have trouble but I want you to take heart Jesus said because I've overcome the world. God's word reminds us that God wants to communicate with us in the midst of suffering. He wants to make sure that we know, and maybe this has something to do with your next step of faith, because God wants to make sure you understand, I'm with you in this. But that's why Jesus came, right? Isn't that why Christmas is so special to us? Matthew 1.23 reminds us, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel which means God with us. Listen, don't you do that with your kids? Don't you reassure them that you're not leaving? You will be with them through the entire ordeal. No matter what, I'm not going to leave your side on this. We think the answer to our questions is an explanation. But God didn't come to give us explanations. He came to give us presence. And knowing that God is in control is more important than knowing what God is doing. That's why it's been important for us to be there for people during this pandemic so that they can see that in the midst of what has turned their life upside down through us, God is still with them. But he also wants to make sure that we know this, and maybe this has something to do with your next step of faith as well. God wants to make sure that he, we know that he understands. That's actually the gist of what we read in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15 that Jesus knows how you feel we have this high priest who stands between us and God who has been tempted in every way as like we have who's dealt with everything that the world could throw at us it threw at him he knows what it's like to suffer and he wants to make sure that we know this as well that the pain that we're going through has a purpose you know, the sting of the needle provides our child with life-saving vaccines. And it's not that we take great pleasure in holding our children down uh, in order to make them cry, but at the time, they struggle to understand the purpose. When Paul writes to the church in Corinth, he reminds them, for sometimes God uses sorrow in our lives to help us turn away from sin and to seek eternal life. And then he adds this thought to that passage. We should never regret his sending it. When he writes to the church in Rome in chapter 8, he says, we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. And we, many of us know or are familiar with that verse. Are you familiar with what he says in the very next verse? In verse 29, it explains how God defines what's good. Being good is being shaped into the likeness of Christ. And sometimes pain is what helps us be molded into the image of who Jesus is. But I want to tell you there can be another purpose as well. When Paul writes again to the church in Corinth, he says this, 
Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort that we ourselves have received from God. You know, right now we are all grieving what life was like, even two months ago. And we're all wondering, is it possible we're even going to get back to that kind of life again? Listen, do you suppose that you're ever going to run into, through throughout the rest of your life, you're ever going to run into someone uh, because of what's going, in the, going on in their life at that moment who will wonder if life is ever going to get back to normal for them? Will there ever be a sense of normal? And maybe this has something to do with your next step of faith. If something has happened, is happening now, has happened in your life, and God, listen, God does not waste our pain if we will allow him to use it to have others see him in our lives. Because there's at least one more lesson God wants to make sure we get. That this pain will be over soon. We anticipate the restrictions being lifted soon. But it's not just this pandemic. Maybe you've suffered through something for 50 years. My dad fought cerebellar degeneration for at least 22 years. And it took away much of his coordination. It messed with his speech. And his death, in part, was caused by his battle with lupus, and he finally lost it. My mom struggled with Parkinson's, which affected her memory. And often, uh, she would ask me a question multiple times. And then she would say something like, I'm sorry, I keep doing that. And I would remind her, Mom, it's okay, you have Parkinson's. It makes it hard to remember things sometimes. And she would say, oh, that's right. And I'll tell you, I tried to be a good son, but honestly, there were times that was frustrating. But compared to the hundreds of millions of years in God's presence, those seven years, those 22 years, those 50 years will seem like a bad hair day or a no hair day. And so Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians 2, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. There is no easy acceptable answer to this, God, why do bad things happen question, but there is a reminder for us all the way at the end of the Bible. John writes, he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. There's going to come a day when there won't be any more starving children. Kids will no longer be orphaned. There won't be any waiting rooms, no supper tables set for one, no tear-stained divorce papers, no motionless ultrasounds, no more caskets. When we get to heaven, I don't think that we'll wonder anymore, why do bad things happen to good people? Really, the question will be, why do good things happen to bad people? And listen, my hope is that you can take your next step of faith during this time. And maybe, maybe from one of those responses, first responses, going from that, moving from that to trusting God, even and especially when you don't understand. And maybe... Maybe you can help someone else take that next step as well. Let's go to him in prayer. God, thank you for who you are. Even we, we don't always understand why you allow the things that you do. And it's frustrating at times because we think that we're so smart that we don't get to understand everything that's going on. Please help us to remember that you are you and that we are not. And help us Father, to lean into you and to trust you, even when we don't understand, especially when we don't understand what's going on around us, and to trust that you can take us from where we are to where you want us to be, and you can help us to become more like Jesus, and in the process, perhaps you will reach through our lives into the lives of other people to help them see you as well and know how much you love them so that they can learn to trust you also. God, help us. We love you so much. Help us to trust you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. There
must be more than this. Oh, breath of God, come breathe within. There must be more than this. Spirit of God, we wait for you. Fill us anew. Set the captives free. Leave us abandoned to your praise. Lord, let your glory fall. Lord, let your glory fall. Consuming fire, fan into flame. today. We hope that anytime we're together, we can be encouraged to then go and represent the kingdom of God well. That we can be Jesus' people who show the world what those who hold on to scripture look like in good times and in bad. And so we are still going. So we'll still look for ways to represent Jesus. If you were with us today and you need prayer for anything, we would love to pray for you. You can fill out a prayer request on our website. 
And if you would consider giving to what God is doing through MCC, you can do that at mccgives.com. We are committed to showing up, to serving people, to love God, to love people, and to live on mission. We will hold on to what makes us great, and that is Jesus equipping us to be his people in the world. Thank you for joining us today.